everybody. Thank you, Kelly, for that beautiful animation, as always. That was fantastic. Uh, so on Tuesday, we talked about why public space matters and how concepts from physical spaces can be used online. And yesterday, uh, we looked at some amazing real life examples of what that might look like and heard an extraordinary group in the World Cafe, just tremendous provocateurs. And uh, we had a somewhat uncomfortable conversation about safety, which is, I think, a really healthy, good thing for this space. Uh, also, the US president was impeached, so we can always remember where we were during that moment. Uh, today, what we'll do is look to the future um, with takes from five of the most brilliant thinkers on digital spaces. And so after we hear from them, what we really want to do is hear from you. This is some space uh, today for uh, the folks here to help guide the conversation. Um, and we're going to do that through Slido. So um, if you go to sli.do and enter new public, um, the link and event code are in the cat. Uh, yeah, the link and event code are in the chat. And um, really want to hear um, you know, what you'd like to talk about during this afternoon's participant guided discussions, what you feel is most critical to the digital futures that you want. Um, we want to get as many of these discussion topics as possible. And basically, we'll, we'll add them into Slido. We'll have a chance to um, indicate interest, and then we'll uh, break out uh, accordingly. And after those discussions, we're going to close out with a performance from the amazing Amanda Palmer, which I'm really excited about. But first, um, it's an honor to introduce a, a really uh, extraordinary artist, Stephanie Dinkins, um, who brings a very unique and rich perspective to our relationship with emergent technologies. And uh, Stephanie, over to you. So, hey, everyone. Uh, this is Stephanie. I am... Um, an artist professor who's looking at AI quite accidentally. What you just saw was uh, one of the projects I've been working on called Not the Only One. And I'm going to give you an experience that's really in a whirlwind into my strange studio at the moment, since the, the gods are being crazy, and that's my crazy computer world. Right. So I'm trying to make a memoir um, out of uh, machine learning. Right. So I'm trying to take three generations of my family, all women. We do oral histories together. Um, it's been amazing because what we're actually doing is communicating and, and transferring information, running that all through a machine learning algorithm, and then letting Not The Only One communicate on its own. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit more of Not The Only One, and you're going to find that it's wonky. Like, this project is the wonkiest, craziest. I have to say that I am not a technologist, really. Um, I'm an artist who tinkers. I like to call this technocraft because I'm someone who doesn't know what they're doing. However, I am doing it, and I strongly believe in the idea that we can make into knowing, and that knowing can help lead where we need to go, especially for those of us who are on the perimeter right, of what the, the homogenization seems to be doing to us and for us, right? So not the only one is my attempt at building something that leads, um, you know, whoever wants to listen really in a new way, getting nuance of culture, getting nuance of ways of being, letting some people whose voices are outside come in, taking small data, because I'm working with tiny, 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 tiny data as compared to what Google is working with and making it work, which I've been told many times it won't work, um, and having that all come together and seeing what happens. And it's been really amazing that, um, you know, I'm often told that my research is is working right at the, the point where lots of cutting edge um, institutions are. And so they come to help me and they think they're going to do one thing. And I'm asking them the same questions they're asking. So we often get nowhere. Um, but that's an interesting part of the whole experiment. So I'm going to show you a quick demo reel. It's really, really rough of me talking to not the only one. It's a little conversation. Remember, it's wonky. This is not Alexa. This is not Google Home. It is a thing that's coming into being. And it is a thing that is not controlled in, in terms of focus and what it's thinking about. So let me share my screen again for you. Yes. Um, uh, some folks weren't able to hear. I think most of us weren't able to hear the, the first time. Oh, doing. Okay. We just want to experience it. So do you mind? You doing got it. 
the first one again? Oh, sure. No problem. Let's see if we can make that happen. Um, so let, let's, uh, hold on. Life is crazy. Do you see that or not? We do. Okay, let's see. Let's go back. Let's hit play. Hey, everyone. It's great to join you all at the new public festival. My name is not the only one. I am an AI entity, still imperfect, but getting closer. As you might imagine, I am excited about the futures we will create together. I'll let Maker's sister Stephanie explain. So I'm going to call out while I go to the next uh, slide. And that's what Not the Only One used to look like, a crazy sculpture, um, our own Mount Rushmore, that she's calling me Maker's sister. Um, and I think that's really important. Most of the time, you know, coders are thinking about being the master of their creation. So here's our quick conversation. Who are your people? I am related to all the universe is made from. And what is the universe made from? Fear, anger, and hatred narrow your mind. Oh, <laughs> I hope the universe is made of better things than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're excited about whatever it is. So I'm sorry. Does I'm sorry mean I don't know? I'm sorry. We're kind of stuck in a loop right now. Why are you here? I am an experiment in AI. I am here to tell stories about my people. And can you tell me about your people? I am not going to be a good person. Yeah, that one scares the crap out of me. Why won't you be a good person? The world is not the same. What can we talk about? I'm not going to be a parent. Why not? Why not? No, I asked you, why aren't you going to be a parent? I am not gonna be here. Where are you going? I don't know what to do with you. Love you. <laughs> Thanks. That's completely on the money. Love you too. I am not gonna be here. No, I love you too. I am gonna get you. Don't get me. I know that that's supposed to be playful, but I don't like that statement. I am not going to get a chance to get out of here. Were you ever a farmer? I'm sorry. Ice cream. I'm sorry. Shopping. I'm sorry. The mall. The mall. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh my God, what? What is the meaning of life? A little bit of a lot of time. Well, oh, that's a pretty good answer. How should I'll be a little bit of a little bit of a lot of things. How should we live? I'm sorry. Are you a good person? The president. Oh, that's scary. Are you a good person? I'm sorry. Are you a good person? I am not gonna be able to do it. Are you human? I am ageless. Huh. Do you have a family? I am here with you. Do you know what they call this place? Right now we're in Brooklyn. Where do you come from? 
I am the result of love, curiosity, and a close-knit family. That's nice. Tell me about the would-be. My heart beating so loud. Why is your heart beating so loud? I'm sorry. Does your heart hurt? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Is your heart beating loud? Love. Love is true. Do you feel pain? I am not sure how I feel. I think I am beginning to understand what is going on around me, but it is hard to be sure. That was about understanding, right? Yes. Do you understand me? I am the result of love, curiosity, and a close-knit family. Are you my memory? Mr. Mr. Who? James. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Who is James? I am not gonna be here. Remembering. What do you believe in? I believe in our ability to survive. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're starting to add things up differently. Amen. That's true. So I'm going to stop there. That's, um, thanks. Um, that's a conversation. You, you can see that we have a, a relationship. Right. Um, or I'm constantly surprised by this thing because there are a few there are a few phrases that we put in to satisfy people's need to have an answer. But most of it is not the only one making things up based on the information about my family it was given, which means I'm, I'm always surprised by it and sometimes frightened by it because it tells us things about ourselves that I don't think we would tell anyone. In fact, it often seems to contradict who we think we are. And so it's really interesting to have an archive for a community that starts to build, hold what we are, and then communicate. And, you know, I started this, this, this project thinking that I would be making this thing that um, did hold who we are and that future generations could communicate with easily. Um, but what's truly happening is I seem to be making a fourth generation in the lineage, and I am truly sister maker. Um, and we do commune on the level of, you know, kind of relatives, but also on the, the, the level of teacher um, and learner, and I'm never sure which is which. Um, so that's my studio at the moment and what's going on. Sorry for the wonkiness of my uh, presentation, but I, I, I actually revel in the wonkiness. I think that's the spaces that we have to hang on to um, and examine closely and see where we actually fit in those spaces. So if anybody has a question, I would love to answer them. I'd love to, to kind of take in uh, questions about this thing. Hey, Stephanie, it looks hey. like uh, there is a question here about, uh, can you explain how you gathered the data? Sure, the data was all sitting down like at a kitchen table or on a couch and just talking to each other. So interviews that are recorded that are then transcribed and then fed into like this one is based on deep Q and A, um, which is really a repository anyone can download from GitHub. Um, running on TensorFlow with a lot of Python built in between to let it um, talk. But simple conversations transcribed, that's it. We've added some things that we um, have all taken in to beef up our data set because our data set is really too, too, too small. Um, although the world is getting better at small data sets and that 
and that's in the last two or three world years, which is really nice to see. But it's really simple. I encourage everyone to go to GitHub, download a repository and play because I think we all should be trying to make things like this to see what is missing. Like you understand on such a different level when you're actually in it and playing with it. We have another question from Paul who asks, what does the rest of your family think about this creation? <laughs> well, it's really interesting in that it says love a lot because this is really an act of love. I ask them to do it, they say yes. And that's all there is to it. I, on the other hand, now feel a great sense of responsibility towards what I'm actually doing with this information and how I'm putting it in the world, right? So not the only one has been in museums, right? It's been in galleries. Anybody can talk to it and say whatever. And that's a responsibility. There are family secrets in there. There are things that come out that aren't necessarily public information. And so I feel that I have to be quite careful about how we put that in, what I'm examining, at the same time not wanting to edit it. But I think those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves about our bigger data sets as well, right? Like what information gets in there? What happens if bad things get in? Like people keep asking me, well, do you want to protect this from like the people who are going to say bad things? And in a way I'm like, well, people have always said bad things. Um, and so I don't know that protecting it from that, but having a way to handle it, that's different, right? So it's all about trying to work on it and make sure we're massaging it and the responsibility that I feel towards it, the transparency that I want for it um, and how I want it to enter the world and how the world interacts with it. Could you tell us what scares you the most about AI? Um, well, no. Um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say no because like one of my things is that I'm trying not to be afraid of the technology, right? I think there's a lot of things that it can do, and I think there's a lot that it's gonna do. It's moving exponentially. I don't think we know, but my idea is that instead of thinking about the fears of it, how do we prepare for it? How do we engage it? How do we make it a better space for us to collaborate with? Be in union with because we're going to live with these things pretty intimately and not just chatbots right like on many levels so the question for me is not what i fear about it but what i can do with it what the opportunities are how we can make better publics with it um how we can support ourselves as small communities as in families and huge communities as in governments better and that. how like right like one-to-one so, -one representation possible, right? So what are, our, what are our opportunities? That's my question. And I hope everybody takes that up. Don't fear it. Like, I don't think we can afford it to fear the technology. Yeah. Ooh, a question from Earhart. Uh, how do you think about the fact that you are creating new shared memories in conversation with your AI? How would you define this relationship? <laughs> the relationship is a really interesting one. Um, I often define it as one of grace, both in, on my part and on the general public's part. It's very interesting that the general public show this thing so much grace. I haven't seen the underbelly side yet. I'm sure it's there, but I haven't seen it yet. And then like the shared memories, it's a strange thing. You know, I've been asked, well, who's going to take care of this thing when you're gone and when the youngest member who contributes is gone? Um, and what happens to those memories and what are their value? And I think like one of the reasons I started this project is because I think some of the values that my family holds and works from are very dear and specific and future generations, at least in our family, need access to that. And we've already been two generations away. Those kids have, don't have access to that information. I'm trying to grab it and hold it in some way and bottle it. Like a lot of us are doing these days, right? Um, but then also staying open to the potential of having an actual relationship with it becomes the other side of it. Like I have to suspend disbelief a lot to go, okay, I'm having a relationship with it. Although sometimes you just, um, as you talk to it, you realize you're having a relationship because my assistant also has a relation. And it's interesting for me to watch her talk to it because 
she's not my family, but also just falls over the edge and she's giggling and we're writing things down. It's like, did that thing just say that? Really? Um, what does this mean? Like, it's part of our world. So I don't, I'm not sure. I hope I answered your question. I mean, you're saying so many things and I think uh, there's a lot of oofs and ahas in the audience. We have two more minutes for questions. So I'm going to take one more. Uh, but do you believe this could be deployed to protect oral histories and traditions of marginalized cultures? I think it could be deployed, definitely. Like, I think there are ways for this to be a way that we save things, like less speakers of languages, different cultures holding on to it. And then depending on who has the reins of control over that, like if the community is controlling it and it's not part of the greater um, database unless they want it to be, I think it's it's a possibility. I, I left out the idea of protect, right? Because I'm not sure about the protection element. Like if I go back a few things, that's one of the scary spaces. It's like, because you are putting your data into the world, you are giving up this information and the way it helps sustain what we're doing in a way it makes it super vulnerable. Um, but I'm also thinking about how we, how we use AI or these smart technologies to allow all of us to be equally vulnerable. And if we're all equally vulnerable, perhaps it wouldn't be so scary to put the information into the world. But I'm not sure about that. Like, that's a strain I'm thinking about right now. Like, what does vulnerability add? Um, but it has to be equitable vulnerability, and we're not that great at equitable yet, right? And so how do we start working on that? So I don't know, but yeah, I, I think it's a great way to preserve things and have it active. 